My name is Candy Fothery. I am the Summit County Sheriff. And uh, I want to say thank you to every one of you for your interest in this project. I felt that this was a, um, a really important subject. And I received so many questions about uh, concealed carry, constitutional carry, and, and laws that I ended up um, talking to, to uh, prosecutor Sherry Bevan Walsh. And um, we started putting this together and it's been extremely beneficial and uh, very well attended. I am very happy that uh, Sherry Bevan Walsh um, has the same vision that I do in public safety. And we have partnered together uh, to bring this kind of a program to you. So the prosecutor's office will talk to you about the laws and then um, my deputies in the back uh, will, they'll come forward after Kevin's done and uh, they'll talk to you about uh, gun safety and take this opportunity, please, ask questions of prosecutor um, Kevin. He will answer anything that, that you have. Um, with him is a civil attorney with the prosecutor's office as well, Marv, and um, he would answer any civil uh, pieces, but Kevin's predominantly gonna be the person that you're gonna be dealing with tonight. Knowing uh, why you have a weapon, how to render it safe, what to do with it, what you can do with it, where you can take it, where you can't, and um, what the laws are that pertain to you, whether you're gonna carry in state or whether you wanna go out of state and carry, all of those things, um, I hope that you have answers to this evening. Good evening. Uh, as stated earlier, my name is Kevin Mayer. I've been with the prosecutor's office for 23 years now. Uh, my current assignment is with the Gun Violence Reduction Task Force. Uh, I, I specifically deal with uh, gun cases, typically felonious assaults and homicides, and I work with the federal government to transfer certain cases to them uh, based on the potential penalties that uh, individuals can receive. Uh, I also teach at two other police academies, the Summit Academy and the Kent uh, Police Academy. I've been doing that for years now. Uh, so I'm going to begin this. We're talking about uh, Senate Bill 215, Constitutional Carry. I'm going to begin this by giving you a, a history lesson. I do this with all my cadets. Now I'm going to do it with you. The Second Amendment. We all know that the first 10 amendments are known as the Bill of Rights. But what most people don't realize is when, when they were first agreed upon, the Constitution, the, the Founding Fathers refused to ratify it because they didn't trust this new concept known as a federal government. They didn't want this federal government telling them what to do, so they said, you got to go back and you got to amend it. And they did, the first 10 amendments. The Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia being necessary for a free state, the right to bear arms shall not be infringed. Paraphrase it. What most people don't realize is the Second Amendment only applied against the federal government. The state governments were free to take guns away at any moment. In 1993, in law school, I did my upper division writing requirement on the Second Amendment. And to my amazement, after doing the research, I found out in 1993, it was a collective right. It was not an individual right. Theoretically, the states could, could go, get, give us your guns. The federal government couldn't take them away from states or state militias, hence the original Second Amendment. Uh, as I said, the first 10 amendments only applied to the feds until the Civil War and until the 14th Amendment, the Due Process Clause. And then slowly through the, the centuries, bits and pieces of the Bill of Rights became applicable to the states. The states had to honor them. In 2008, Heller versus DC, the very first case where the Supreme Court finally, after 200 and some odd years, said the Second Amendment is an individual right. So individuals have the right to have guns. 
Washington, D.C. had very strict gun laws. You could have a gun in your house, but it had to be disassembled. Uh, Heller sued, went all the way up to the Supreme Court. First time. It's an individual right. That brings us full circle all the way to last June. I think it was, I want to say June 13th. We became the 24th state. Not all the states have this. We wouldn't be having this conversation if we were sitting in New York right now. But this is Ohio. And we became the 24th state to say, you know what? The Second Amendment applies to Ohioans. It's an individual right. Uh, Ohioans have the right to carry a concealed firearm without the necessity of getting a permit from the sheriff's office. That didn't exist forever either. For decades, they put it on the voting ballot to get the permission to carry a concealed handgun. Most people don't realize this, but open carry was always legal. I can march down the street right now with an AR-15 strapped to my back. And I could have done that 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Open carry was completely legal. It's having one concealed that was illegal until 2008. For the first time in the state of Ohio, they, they took another shot at it and it passed. Uh, fun fact, a, a group that was always opposed to it year after year was the Fraternal Order of Police. And I understand their position. I, I, I sympathize with them. They pull someone over, they walk up to a car, they don't know what, they don't want a lot of people to be armed. And I, and I get that. I get that. But the Second Amendment is what it is. So in 2008, the state of Ohio said, uh, citizens in good standing, citizens in good standing could now go to the sheriff's office and apply for a permit. And once approved by the sheriff's office, once you got that permit, you are now allowed to take a handgun and conceal it in your pocket, in your car, wherever because you had that permit. Now, the legislative branch did throw a bone to the police. He said, well, we're gonna add this to the law. Any, anyone who has a permit, if they get stopped by the police, that person must be proactive. They must immediately state to the police, uh, sir, I have, a, I have a carry conceal license and I do have a firearm on me. Failure to do so is a crime. That was the one thing they gave to the FOP. Fast forward to June 13th, 2022. The law changed, as I said, but that we're going to discuss at length because it's a little complicated. At that time, the state of Ohio said, uh, you know, Second Amendment's the Second Amendment. We don't need to get permission. So as long as you are a qualified adult, and that's what we're going to talk about. As long as you are a qualified adult, you don't need to go to the sheriff's office to get a permit because we already have the Second Amendment. Now, here's the question. What do I mean by qualified adult? Anybody know? Yeah. Legally allowed to carry or possess a gun. Yeah. Legally allowed. I'll interpret this for you make it simple. The law basically states now that had you gone to the sheriff's office and applied, had the sheriff approved, so you don't have to go, but if you would have gone and they would have approved, congratulations, you're a qualified adult. And if you're a qualified adult, you, you, you don't have to go to the sheriff's office. That's all it means. But you need to know what the heck a qualified adult means. Uh, I'm sure, what's your name? Ed? Yeah. Let's say Ed here was convicted eight years ago of resisting arrest. It's a misdemeanor. It doesn't matter. Not a bit, but it's only a misdemeanor? It doesn't matter. You know what? He's not a qualified, how did you know that? You, you already take this class? No. All right. If, if he, it, it, it's, it's one of the details. It's one of the details. If you have a prior conviction of resisting arrest from 10 years ago, then if you went to the sheriff's office to apply, the sheriff's office would find that and go, I'm sorry, Ed, you, we can't issue a license to you now. You can't get it. And if he couldn't get that, then he can't be a qualified adult. When can he become a qualified adult? Two more years. 
just two more, he'd have to wait two more years and then he magically becomes a qualified adult. Because the, the arrest, the conviction, I'm sorry, the conviction for resisting arrest will have passed the 10 year mark. And then he becomes a qualified adult. That's just one example that we're gonna go through here. Uh, the new law effective June 13th, 2022, it wasn't retroactive. Uh, if you were, if you got in trouble the day before, you can still be prosecuted. Uh, the permit system still in place. You can still go get one. I, I highly recommend it for a few reasons. <sighs> look, look I'm, a, I'm a Second Amendment fan, but I, I think we should all be trained. I really do. I mean, I, I, I own a gun. Uh, my wife wasn't too happy with that. I think she hit the bullets. But uh, it, yeah, it, it made me a little nervous at first. It made me a little nervous, I, and I'm like, oh, okay, you know. So uh, it would be a good thing to get training. You still can. You can get that uh, CCW permit. And there are minor differences. I, I think there's one difference that I, I wasn't even aware of until, until I talked to Marvin today. We've had these discussions. When this law first came out, I talked to my boss about it, and I, I said, oh, man, we're going to need some case law. We're going to need some judges to rule on things to figure this out. There's no new case law as of yet. But it's not a bad idea to, to get the training. And it's not a bad idea to get the background check. Because if Ed here didn't realize that that prior arrest, it's not a big deal. It, it, he may have, under the new law, he may have carried around a gun, and it, but he shouldn't have because he wouldn't have been considered a qualified adult. And the sheriff's office can do that for you. The sheriff's office can do the, will, will do the background check. And they'll come back and say, you, you can carry, which automatic, automatically makes you a qualified adult. But you get the bonus of getting the training. Uh, that, like I said, that's an important thing. I, I kind of want everyone to know how to handle a firearm, including myself. Uh, let's see. Some states, I know we didn't discuss this, but, but uh, some states might not honor your carry conceal. Uh, if, if you go to another state and go, I'm a qualified adult, I'm not here, you're not. But they might honor the actual CCW from Ohio because you got the training and got the background check. You'd have to check that if you want to go on vacation and take a gun. My advice, check on it. Go online. It couldn't hurt. Uh, let's see. The, the new law it applies to improper handling. Improper handling refers to having improperly handling a firearm in a motor vehicle. That's actually a felony, felony of the fourth degree. But if, you, if you're considered a qualified adult, that won't be a problem for you. Uh, it applies to handguns. Uh, it doesn't apply to rifles. Remember I told you I can walk around with a rifle, open carry, I can just do this. I can't point it at people. That's against the law. But I can carry it on my back and I can walk around. Interestingly enough, if I take that same rifle and it's loaded and I put it in my car, because I just got through walking around and I want to drive home and I, and I put it on the, the floorboard and I get in my car and drive away and I get pulled over and a deputy looks and says, there's a rifle. I can get charged. The new law doesn't apply to rifles. It only applies to firearms. If you have a rifle in your car, you better take, you, you better disassemble it or take, take the uh, magazine out, keep it separate. There's rules for that as well. But the new law only applies to what you can conceal on you if you're a qualified adult. A qualified adult, a person who is a qualifying adult may carry a concealed handgun anywhere in this state in which a person who has been issued a concealed handgun license may carry a concealed handgun. So you're gonna be treated just as if you went to the sheriff's, applied, and the sheriff gave you a CCW permit. Because the sheriff would have to do a background check in accordance with 2923.125A through S. Don't worry, there's not a test later. But that those are all the things that the sheriff looks at before deciding, okay, you're you know, you can carry. Uh, and and if you're a qualified adult, you're treated just like somebody who did get the license. That's the point. State of Ohio will likely have the burden of proving someone is not a qualified adult. Yes. Sure. Yes, it, 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 assuming you're a qualified adult. If you're a qualified adult, 
It can be hidden. It, the pistol can be hidden on you. But it can be in the trunk loaded. Yes. Yes. Yes, that's the difference. Yeah, I don't know why that. I, it always scratched my head. It's like a rifle? I, I, I can carry the rifle, but the moment I... Because it's considered hidden. And that's why... And, and one, of the, one of the... If you look at the law, one of the things that eliminates that problem is if you have a gun rack. Because now it's in the open. It's no longer hidden. The rifle's no longer hidden. Anyway. Uh, who is a qualified adult? The right of a person... The right of a person who is a qualifying adult is the same right uh, as is granted to a person who has been issued a carry conceal handgun license. A qualifying adult uh, is subject to the same restrictions as applied to a person who has been issued a carry conceal handgun license. If a provision requires a conceal handgun license to engage in specific conduct or prohibits a conceal handgun license from engaging in a specific conduct, that provision shall be construed as the same. Uh, in short, if you could get a permit, you are now treated as though you have one. So uh, that, that's, that's the new law as of June 13th. If you could have gotten it. If you could have gotten it. Now, I lecture to police officers on the new law as well, because if, you, if we go back to this part, uh, the state of Ohio will likely have the burden of proving someone is not a qualified adult. Oof. Back in the old days, when an officer would pull you over, their typical questions as they approach the window would be, uh, hi, license and registration, right? Well, now I instruct officers, um, hi, license, registration, and are you armed? They get to ask that. If you lie to them, it's, a, it's an M2, I want to say. It's, it's a misdemeanor. If, if they ask you, if they... It, remember that rule I told you when we when we allowed permits? It's, they said people have to be proactive. You have to immediately tell the officer, "I'm armed. I, I I have a license and I'm armed." That's gone as of June 13th. That's gone, which means now the police have to be proactive, and the police they don't want to they want to go home alive, so they have the right to go license registration and and are you armed? But the burden, like I said, the burden is on them to prove you're not a qualified adult. And, and I, I always wondered this. I go, oh, they, I know they have their computers in their cars now, but I don't believe they can be as thorough as the sheriff can be when they do the background checks. And, and here's a list of the things that makes you a qualified adult. You have to be 21 or older. If I were 19 and I went to the, sh and before last June, I went to the sheriff and said, I want a license. Well, I'm going to fail that first part. Yeah, come back when you're 21. Uh, you're not prohibited. Here's the part that, that Marv kind of covered. You are not pro prohibited under 18 United States Code. This is the feds. Uh, uh, United States Code 922 G1 through 9, or, or this is Ohio, Revised Code 292313. 29, uh, I recognize that one because I prosecuted that for 23 years. That's having a weapon while under disability. And what that essentially means, if, if you're charged under that section, that means you, you, you did something bad. You, you have a prior conviction for a felony of violence. You have a prior drug conviction. You are currently a fugitive from justice. You are currently challenging charges. You've been indicted for a, dr a drug charge or, or a felony of violence. You, uh, you have been, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You've been probated. You've been adjudicated, uh, Mental, mentally deficient? Is that the term now? Defective. Mentally defective. Yeah. Adju oh, you had to have been adjudicated. So you had to have been found. A, a court had to say that, uh, hey, there's something wrong with this person mentally. Uh, then you're not allowed to have a gun under this code section. We know that's been big issues in the country right now. But there, there is a short laundry list of things that put you under this. If if there's a civil protection order, my wife goes to court and gets a civil protection order against me. That's for five years. Guess what? I could no longer have a firearm. There had to be good cause for that. Uh, yeah, while the, civil, while the protection order is on. If you get it changed, if you get it eliminated, that's fine. But that's why, that's why they have a hearing without you. And then by law, they have to give the right to have a hearing and argue. That this should not be on me. But if a judge rules that, hey... She needs a protection order. You got to stay away from her. Cops come and take the guns. 
That's that's part that's that's under that Ohio revised code section. And and the reason we have this is you know, somebody might have a protection order on them, and then when the law passed, they said, Oh great, I can go get a gun. And they don't even realize, oh, you're not a qualified adult. Had you gone to the sheriff, the sheriff would have found that and said, I'm sorry, sir, we can't give you this. But now that no one has to go, the, uh, you, you just don't know. You just don't know until you until you come here. Yes. Uh, you said uh, uh, a misdemeanor resistance. Correct. What other uh, in a DD? I'm, I'm here. Here we go. Here's the list. We're going to go. Uh, um, satisfy most of 29. Uh, th this is the section I was talking about. 29, 23, 125. The, the, the concealed handgun applications. This is what the sheriff looks at or, or did. It still do when, you, when people apply. But th it's, it's the list of things that uh, mean you can, be a, you can have a, uh, a license. Uh, let's see. Under under the federal law, it shall be unlawful for any person who has been convicted of a crime punishable by a term exceeding one year. Ohio used to have four levels of felonies. And years ago, 20 years ago, we added a fifth. And the fifth, the lowest level, F5, is punishable between six months and a year. But it doesn't exceed that. So if you've been popped for a felony five in Ohio, that doesn't apply. Because it says punishable by a term exceeding one year. Uh, if you're a fugitive from justice... If there's a warrant out for your arrest, you guess what? You're not allowed to have a gun. It is, un, it is an unlawful user of or addicted to any controlled substances. <laughs> you know, this one's always driven me crazy. Uh, unlawful user. Does that mean if I smoke a joint once, I, I'm, I now fall under this section and therefore I can't be a... I don't know. You know what we need? We need case law. Because that, that's what the Fed said. Uh, but I have not seen case law. I mean, theoretically... If I'm if if I'm caught, you know, smoking uh, marijuana, uh, unlawful user of. It's a controlled substance by the Fed law, because it says un, unlawful user of or is addicted, or is addicted uh, to a controlled substance. So that's I, I, I've I've been doing this for years. I've never popped anyone under that subsection. Uh, has been adjudicated mentally defective or has been committed to a mental institution. The Fed rule right here mirrors 2923.13, what I talked about, about the Ohio law, weapons under disability. Sometimes they're just going to be the same. That's all. Uh, if you're an illegal alien, so if, you came, if, you, if you're not a documented worker here, you, you came into America w without going through the proper ports, whatever, and you have a firearm, you're in violation of the federal law. Uh, or you've been dishonorably discharged from the military. So if you were dishonorably discharged from the military, uh, you may have all the training in the world with firearms. Uh, you're, you're not, you're not going to be a qualified adult. Uh, or, I've never seen this one yet, has renounced citizenship. You renounce your citizenship, but you stick around. The, I, once, again, once again, never had this, but theoretically it's possible. Uh, or, we talked about this, is subject to a protection order. If my wife went to court and the judge granted her a protection order, because the judge has to conclude that I'm a threat. It's not just as simple as going, I need a protection order. There has to be evidence. There has to be evidence. But if there is evidence, and she is granted a protection order, i got to hand in my guns. I, I don't have to destroy them. I, don't, I, I could give them to family members. Can't be at my house can't be at my house. Uh, if I've been convicted of any misdemeanor domestic violence, I think someone asked that question. Uh, under the federal rules, if, if you got that, you're not technically a qualified adult. Uh, any of these, uh, it's unlawful for you to possess or receive a firearm. Uh, remember, it always cracks me up. I have cases where I listen to like people get arrested and they go, oh, the joke's on them. I didn't own it. My cousin owned it. You know, I was just transporting it back to my cousin. It's like, yeah, but you possessed it. Ownership's irrelevant. I don't care about it. When I'm prosecuting someone, I don't care about it. I don't have to prove you bought it. It's in your name. Just that you possessed it. If it was in your pocket. Now, this is another section. And, and like I said, these overlap. This is the section that I typically try. I, I only deal with felonies. Uh, so uh, if you have a gun in your car and, and 
you're one of these, or you have a gun in your pocket, or the police are in your house and they find it in your bedroom, and you're one of these, you could get charged under 2923.13, weapon under disability. Fugitive for injustice, if you're under indictment uh, or for or convicted of a felony offense of violence. Uh, under indictment for or convicted uh, of a felony drug offense. Uh, drug dependent. I've never had one of those because what defines drug dependent? You know, that, that's always driven me crazy. I still haven't had one of those cases, still waiting for it after 23 years. Uh, as we just discussed uh, previously, adjudicated, mentally incompetent, defective, or has been committed. You don't get committed unless a judge says so. And if you're committed, someone else is handling your money, paying your bills. We're talking about that level. Uh, let's see. Okay. These are the ones we were talking about. This is, this is most of, it's not all of it, but it's most of what the sheriff has to go through when they run your background check. So the applicant, uh, be legally living in the U S, uh, you had to be 21, not be under indictment or otherwise charged with a felony, uh, a drug offense, a misdemeanor offense of violence, not have a suspended CCW permit for a misdemeanor conviction. So if you currently have, th this is, this one was weird. I thought, so if you have a suspended CCW permit, uh, for some misdemeanor conviction, and then the law changed, you don't get to go, Oh, well, my permit's worthless. Anyway, I'm a qualified adult. Eh, if you had that, you're, you're not a qualified adult. So that's kind of a, I, I thought that was a little weird, but there it is. Um, okay. Also, not have convictions. Now we're now we're not just talking about under indictment or charged. Now we're saying not you. If you have these convictions, felony drug offense, assault on a peace officer, that could be an F, an F four all the way up to an F one. If you just if you punch me, and just give me a bruise, it's a misdemeanor. But if you punch an officer in uniform, it's jacked up to an F four, as long as you knew it was an officer. Uh, let's see, any misdemeanor punishable by imprisonment greater than a year. We talked about that. Like I said, some of these things overlap. Uh, a misdemeanor offense of violence within the last three years. So if you've had a, if you had a conviction two years ago for a misdemeanor offense of violence, an M1 assault, you punched me and gave me a black eye and you did it in front of a cop and you got arrested in charge. You got an M1 punishable by up to six months. Uh, you got probation. Now, Marv, answer this if you can for me. Does the three years begin at the, the date you were finally finished probation or the date of the conviction? If you know, I mean. Uh, I'm not sure. I think it's, I don't know. See, I, no, I, well, when you're done with your I, I believe that to be the case, too, because I know when it comes to expunging records, the clock starts the day you finished probation. So let's err on the side of caution and say, when we're talking about the three years, we're talking about uh, the time you finished your probation or you finished your sentence. You may have gotten a week and no probation. So when you finish that week, then the three years starts. So three years later, if, if you have nothing else except that, three years after that date, you magically become a qualified adult. Uh, so let's see, two or more convictions for assaults or negligent assaults within, the, within five years and... For some reason, I always thought this was crazy. The resisting arrest goes back 10 years. I thought the assault would be more serious, but apparently here it is. Resisting arrest within 10 years. So if you have a, a, a resisting arrest conviction eight years ago, you're not a qualified adult. Now the question is if cops pull you over and, and you have a gun and you go, oh, I'm a qualified adult. And the, I, I believe they have the ability to run your record. I'm not sure of how their computer system works. I know it's very complicated now, but they can go back there and go, ah, oh, you, you got eight years ago. Uh, you're not a qualified adult. You can't have this gun in the car under these circumstances. Um, you can't be subject to a protection order. We talked about that. And you, you could not have been dishonorably discharged from the military. The, this essentially, there were a few other things that aren't really applicable to this, but this is essentially the laundry list of what the sheriff's department does prior, well, they still do it, but what they definitely were doing prior to, to June 13th when you were applying for that application. They were looking at all these, and you may have been contacted and said, sorry, we can't give you the permit. But now, you know, people all of a sudden believe they can carry, but one of these might have affected them, and they just don't know it. 
let's see, sealed expunged convictions and minor misdemeanors cannot be considered. Okay, so if you had a record sealed, I mean, back in the old days, you only got one mulligan in life. You only got to, you only got to expunge one bad thing. If you had two uh, convictions, judges would say, sorry, you had two. Now, I, I think it's up to five now. Quite a few. Yeah, now you can have, and I understand the, the logic is we want people to be able to get jobs. So if, if you actually take the time to spend the money to, to file the motion and get your record expunged, because I've seen people saying, well, you know, that was 20 years ago and I'm applying for my uh, license to do some kind of job and I, I need to expunge this record. Sure, I get that. I get that. Oh yeah, you can't. There are certain things you can't expunge: murder, you can't expunge rape. That that's that's permanent. That follows you for the rest of your life. But but other offenses, yes, you can get them expunged. And the expunge stuff, good news, the expunge stuff uh, would not be considered. It, it it would not nullify you being a uh, qualified adult. Yeah, minor misdemeanors are not. Yeah, I don't think they ever apply. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Changes for changes for actual permit holders. If you already spent the money and got the permit in the training, uh, no longer required to carry your permit on you. No longer required to promptly inform officers that you have a gun. The one thing they gave officers, they took it away. Uh, now they only need to disclose if asked by a law enforcement officer. Uh, so uh, permit holders and qualified adults. So both, if you have a permit and you or you're just a qualified adult. You, you don't have to say it out loud, but if it's asked, you have to tell them the truth. And failure to do so is a misdemeanor of the second degree. And I believe the maximum penalty there is 60 days in jail. Uh, let's see, these are hypotheticals they wanna throw at us now. Uh, while Bill is at the upper deck, he has a loaded handgun concealed in his waistband. Bill does not have a carry concealed handgun permit. Uh, and he is a qualified adult. Question number one, I, I lied, there is a test. Uh, is Bill permitted to carry a loaded handgun in a bar? Why not? Correct, correct. I can bring a gun to a bar. However, the moment, uh, would your answer change if he was intoxicated? Yes. Having a firearm while intoxicated is a charge. I, I've convicted people of such. So uh, that is illegal. What if he is just drinking beer? <laughs> Come on. Come on. The answer is one sip and you violated the law. When I was a defense attorney on DUI cases, I used to ask potential jurors, is it illegal to drink and drive? Is it? No, it's not. I can have, a, I can have one beer right now and get in my car. I'm 260 pounds. That's not going to affect me. So I, I, basically I was trying to explain to them, yeah, yeah, it's legal as long as you're not drunk. That doesn't apply here. If you have one beer, you can't go, I'm sober. Nope, you have a gun, you can't do that. Wyatt Earp is traffic stopped for an equipment violation. Officers smell marijuana, which by the way, that's called the plain smell, which means you, you're allowed, you're not allowed to smoke marijuana in a car. You can't go, ah, oh, permit. Nope, you're not allowed to do that. Uh, they can still search the car. During a search, they find a loaded, American Arms AM-15 on the passenger floorboard. Earp does not have a carry concealed permit, but he is a qualified adult. Any problems there? What's the problem? Ah, you guys are listening. Yeah, it's a rifle. It doesn't apply. The, the new law applies to firearms. Yes. So if you have that proverbial gun rack. That's one of the cures. Okay, yeah, but if the gun's on it, is it allowed to be loaded or does it have to be unloaded? I, I think it has to be unloaded, doesn't it? it has to be unloaded. Yeah, so no that's good. Even if yeah, openly displayed. And the code section even says, with the um, what's that called? With the thing open, yeah, the, action's open. the action's open. Yeah, the action's open. When I first had a, a rifle, I first I was forty nine. I got my first gun. I got an ARs. I traded it for a handgun. But uh, I walked into a gun shop to go shoot it. And they're like, "Hey, can you uh, can you open that?" And I'm like, "What? <laughs> no idea what he's talking about." Now I know. Uh, let's see. Is Wyatt uh, allowed to carry a loaded firearm in his passenger floorboard? You answer that, no. Same question, but now it's a handgun. Can he carry a handgun on the floorboard? Earp does not, he, he's a qualified adult. Yeah, but so, marijuana. Uh, what if they find marijuana too? Is he, is he 
but he's not impaired. The, the, they say you're fine, it doesn't matter, but I, I, I don't know. I think the case law... Well, you're asking different questions there. Yeah, they forget about the marijuana for a second. He was, if he's a qualified adult, he, he was allowed to have the handgun. But now, he's got to deal with the marijuana. If, if he just has marijuana and he is not impaired, he hasn't smoked it, just the minor, even a minor impairment, I think you're okay because marijuana is okay. It's legal in Ohio. The gun is legal. He can't be impaired, so it just depends on whether he's impaired or not. Now, if you are impaired, not though, if you. That's why that he was smoking it in the car? Not necessarily not. If it's that really strong stuff, you may still smell it. If you are impaired, not only will you get charged with an OVI, but now it's an improper handling because you were handling a firearm while intoxicated. So that's a problem. But otherwise, it's not going to be the F4 improper handling of a firearm. So let's see. Uh, what if they find cocaine? Yeah, you got bigger problems. <laughs> you got bigger problems. Any amount of cocaine is a felony. Uh, once you get past five grams, now you get an F4, and then it goes higher and higher and higher. So uh, under those circumstances, it, you, you can still own a gun. It, you're just going to get charged with a drug charge under the circumstances. Uh, what if he's actively smoking marijuana at the time? Once again, if you're impaired, if you're impaired, you're not allowed to be smoking. That could be a different charge. But if you're impaired, although I would still argue under the federal rules, under under United States Code 18, theoretically, you could still get charged with that. But but as I say said, it's not your, say it's not your marijuana. It's your wife's marijuana. It's in the car. But it says I'm smoking it. Oh, okay, last one. Yeah. At, yeah. at that point, yeah, you got a problem. Yeah, yeah. So like I said, it, it, look, we just made the law. It, it, it seems like there's, there's federal rules that are, that are even more draconian. And you could theoretically say, oh, if you're smoking marijuana, then you are not a qualified adult. And therefore, you, you can't have a gun, period. I mean, I, I, you can make that argument as a prosecutor. But the local guys probably won't charge you with that. Uh, what if they arrest him for OVI and he provides a urine sample proving that he had 900... Uh, uh, nanograms per milliliter of marijuana metabolite in his urine. That's a bad amount, just to let you know. So uh, th then, I, I kind of already gave that away. You, you would get charged not only with the OVI, but having a weapon while intoxicated. Uh, so therefore, improper handling of a firearm in a motor vehicle. Uh, let's see. Billy the Kid is out of apples. He goes at a giant eagle to restock and takes his favorite six-shooter with him. Concealed under his jacket, there is a sign at the entrance pursuant to 2923.1212 stating that unless otherwise authorized by law, no guns allowed. Billy is a qualified adult. If Billy uh, has a CC permit, is he allowed to carry? No. It is a criminal trespass. He's allowed to carry, but he's not allowed to go in the store with it because the store owners essentially asked, hey, don't bring it in here. That's all. But it's not a gun charge. If you do go in there, it's not a gun charge. It is akin to a criminal trespass. Because you're going in, you, you, were, you were asked not to come in with a the gun. Therefore, by stepping in, you are essentially committing a trespass. You're unwelcome because you have the gun. That's all that means. Bottom line, what it comes down to, if you could have gotten a CCW permit, even though you don't have to, you're now treated as if you did get it. That's a qualified adult. Good evening, everyone. It's nice to be in here with a bunch of qualified adults, right? Did you, did you ever think you'd spend, uh, I don't know, an hour and a half talking about whether you're a qualified or uh, adult or not? Um, so, but that's gun. We really appreciate what they do as far as explaining the laws and getting into the legal portion of that. Um, and as far as what well, we've done these before, and what's happened is nobody, everybody asks a lot of good questions. And these, uh, these are the gentlemen to ask the specific laws to, whether it's civil, whether it's criminal, and so on and so forth. But is anybody interested in the, uh, as far as safety goes, in their home, what right do you have to defend yourself or the castle law? Is anybody interested in that? Good. They're still here. So I'm not sure if there's anything as far as new with the Castle Law, but if you could explain that possibly, because this has come up with all the other ones, uh, all the other you know seminars we put on is about the Castle Law. Sure, and, and I 
And again, I guess I would, first of all, if you have questions about the Council Doctrine in Ohio, a good reference is that Ohio Attorney General's book. It does explain it. It can be a little bit confusing, but I get, you know, the bottom line is with the Council Doctrine, it provides if someone that, you, that doesn't have any right to be, let, let's talk about your home, first of all. If they don't have a right to be there, they have no privilege to be there, and either they are trying to enter or have already entered your home, and you use force to defend yourself, whether it's deadly force or some other force, a lesser force, under the law, you are presumed to have, to have acted in self-defense. What that means is that there's a presumption that you acted that way, and a prosecutor, if they, if they thought something was fishy with that, they would have to disprove that. They would have the burden of proof to say that you were not acting in self-defense. Um, so a couple, couple elements there. One is, you can defend yourself anywhere legitimately. If you didn't start the confrontation and you had a reasonable and honest belief that your life was either in danger of you were in danger of death or serious bodily injury. The Ohio used to have a, law, a third element of that, which was you had to retreat if you could safely do so. They did away with that a couple of years ago. That's the new stand your ground law in Ohio. Under the Castle Doctrine, you can always stand your ground. That's your castle, you're in your home. You never had a duty to retreat in your home. So they've kind of Everything has shifted more to the castle doctrine, other than the presumption outside of your home. Um, as far as it, does the castle doctrine give you a greater right to basically kill someone in your home? No, it doesn't. You still still have a level of self-defense. You have to have not started the confrontation. You have to have a reasonable and honest belief that your life was in danger or you're in danger of serious bodily injury. And if you don't meet those qualifications, you're not going to lawfully be defending yourself in the capital doctrine, assuming the prosecutor can disprove, can, di can disprove one of those elements. It doesn't protect you. But it's, it's, it's a, a, an added element of, of protection in your home. Um, not every state has a capital doctrine. Ohio, it's actually by statute. It used to be common law, now it's by statute. Um, different states treat it in different ways. Some states don't have it at all. They may have different elements. In Ohio, it includes your home. It would include any place where you're kind of basically residing. So this goes through the hotel room. The statute even says, the state is a tent. If you're living in a tent, that is your castle, and you can protect yourself under that castle doctrine. You have a castle. That's what it is. It's so it, it, it actually in the statute. So in your car. In your car, yes. That's the other place where it is uh, the capital doctrine applies. In your car or a, I, I believe it's a, a close, I forget how it's worded, a close relative. It's kind of a strange differentiation. So if you're in a car with someone that's not related to you, you're not, and you're not the driver, you can still defend yourself, but you may not have protection under the capital doctrine. So it's a weird, yeah, a little bit of a weird thing. I've really never seen any cases on that, uh, but it, it, be aware of that. Would still be you have that to be outside of the apartment, outside of the house. Well, it's the same. It's the same. You you have if you're defending yourself, you have you need to have not started the confrontation. You have to have a reasonable, honest belief of bodily, serious bodily harm or death. Now, you can always defend yourself with lesser than, uh, yeah. with less than yeah. lethal force. Yeah. So, you know, just remember that. I mean, you, you don't have to shoot somebody. Mm -hmm. Probably everybody in here, does everybody own a gun? There's probably, probably a lot of people in here own a gun. What was the first thing you did? I, I want to own a gun. So I'm going to get a gun, okay? Why did you want to get a gun, first of all? We're going to kind of step through this. What, why do you want to get a gun? 
Why would you want to have one? What? Protection. Okay? Protection, right? Um, and when we talked about the legal side of now protection and you being able to protect yourself legally, right? When you, when you decided you were going to get one, did you have a gun in mind? Did you like, I want this gun, I want this. Hey, my second cousin's mailman, right, told me that this is a great gun. How did you get your gun? How did you determine what gun you wanted? Trial and error. Trial and error, <laughs> right? What's that? One of each. One of, one of each, right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah. <laughs> one of each. But what were some of the criteria? That's first, right. Like, why do I want this? What is going to be... I'm going to tailor it to a need that I have. And everyone, hunting, everyone, could be protected. Target shooting, right? You're a sportsman, target shooting. I chose the 12 gauge because I believe that I'd have a better chance of hitting my target under difficult circumstances. Okay, yeah. Um, there's room for error. Yeah. Right, with that, I kind of make myself for that. So when we talk about getting a gun, first, why do I want it, right? And, and what are happening? And then and it goes like, okay, so here's specifically why I want it, and this is what I want to use it for. And then you go out and you you get a gun to fit that need. Um, once you get that gun, and, and you all you all realize, myself and Nate and anybody here, we're not here to insult your intelligence with anything uh, because you already know a lot of this stuff. But it's always good to go over. Is it important to know how that gun that you wanted for your need functions? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, right? So when you talk about how it functions, how it's loaded, how to make it safe, um, and, and then we figure out, okay, we learned that gun, and you've got it, okay? You've got it. Now, after that, that's for you, right? Can this gun be exposed to other individuals that you know? Or is it possible for them to come in contact with it? Okay, you know how it functions, you know how it works, you know how it operates, but other people, have you satisfied that condition with other people possibly living in your home? Are they aware of it? Okay, I know growing up, grew up in green, uh, mid 70s and 80s, uh, we could hunt in green, there was property, green's a little different than it was back, back in those days, but I kind of grew up, with with weapons with weapons so i was always my father as soon as i started getting curious about him which is about the time i could walk uh he made sure that i knew about those guns ins and out he also had rules and he was old-fashioned if i broke the rules when it comes to getting access to a gun or curiosity and i was dealing with guns outside the household rules i was going to pay for it right so i grew up with that um so we look at educating, educating others about the gun, all right, and those that are be, going to be exposed to that weapon. Have you done that? I mean, I mean, have you have you looked at that? Have you checked that box, all right? Because if somebody comes in and can can your kids or grandkids, could they have kids over at your house too? So multiple people can be exposed to this. If something goes awry and somebody gets that gun in your house and something bad happens with that firearm, who's responsible? Who do you think? Right? You are, okay? So that's a responsibility of a gun owner too. Not only to know the law, when can I use it? When can I use it? How can I travel with it? How, is, can I keep it concealed, not concealed? All that's very important too. But another responsibility is that you're responsible for that item. And if it gets it on the hand. We got the weapon, I'm sure, we got the weapon to, in our home, to have some type of response to some type of altercation that you needed to protect yourself from serious bodily harm or death. So we have that. It has to be secured. But what else does it have to be as well? If you're gonna use it in response to some type of dangerous situation. What does it have to be? It's got to be accessible. 
right? It's got to be accessible. I mean, it's, it's not going to do you good at 2.30 in the morning. Somebody comes busting in and you're running over what? <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> right? And we know that, right? We know that. Anybody have gun locks here? The actual gun locks. What are you using for the weapon? What kind of gun lock? Got a trigger guard? That's one. Anybody got anything else? What's the other one? That's very common. So we got a trigger lock, cable lock, right? Cable lock. Um, are are you using those? Mm -mm. Some do, some don't. It depends on your situation, and each each situation is unique, right? It's got to be accessible. Uh, got to know how to use it, but it also has to be secured. Somebody give me what they. If if you if you care to go ahead and let us know how do you store a gun in your house biometric safe okay pretty good seems to work from you what do you like about it everybody know what that is but go, explain what it is Sure, absolutely, absolutely, and, and and those are those are huge concerns. So there's always a a marriage of security and accessibility, and within that realm, you have to figure out what is going to determine that best marriage, with the understanding if something happens with that gun and somebody gets a hold of it, I really shouldn't, and there's a tragedy, and there's been many tragedies. We're all aware of that, right? If there's a tragedy, you're responsible for that. Okay? So that, that's, that's very important. All right? Anyone else? Anyone else? How, how do you secure a weapon in your home? Anybody else want to share? Okay? It's broken down. Can you assemble it quickly? Yes. Okay? Okay. Okay. Have you ever forgot? Not that I, not that I remember. Yeah, kids are curious about stuff, right? I mean, we're always climbing and, and, and get. Don't don't ever uh, underestimate. Hey, your your kids like three foot eight. And, hey, I've got it up here at eight foot. They'll never get it, <laughs> right? I mean, they'll never get. It. Oh, they're gonna get it. They're gonna find a way. They're very resourceful. Okay. When we were young, we were very resourceful. All right. So just understand that securing that is your responsibility. All right. I have some, what we really like, instead of keeping it under the pillow, right, at night, which people still do that. People still, if you feel, I, the only thing I suggest there, if you feel you have to have a weapon underneath your pillow, I, first of all, transfer it to your spouse's pillow. <laughs> so that's, that's number one. That, that's good tactically sound uh, advice. Um, if you have that, then it, because you feel you need that, you need to try to, if you can, move and move to another area. Okay. So what we like to do is usually when we're thinking about storing things, every situation is unique to at one point before you get that gun in your hand, put your feet on the floor. Why is that? Why do you think? 2.30 in the morning, you hear something. Your, your balance would be off? You mean like your physical balance? Yeah, maybe your cognitive. You're off balance cognitively. Right? And you can't, and you're not clear of thought. Right? Yeah. A little time be between one 
you start to you start to you start the ability to think versus grabbing your gun out of some type of uh, tired. Okay, I'm tired. I'm not able to think through. I'm, I'm don't. I can't assess this situation accurately, and then a tragedy happens. Okay, a tragedy happens. So having having that is very important. I I know one thing in talking to dip, uh, talking to different individuals, and it's all predicated again on that unique situation. Is as far as a handgun goes, and and talking to this individual, and knowing their circumstances, and marrying security with accessibility under their situation um, with the handgun having a loaded magazine in it and everybody probably knows how weapons work here having a magazine in it but not fully seated everybody everybody got that magazine loaded but it's not seated there is a manual safety on the weapon it's on and there's not one charge there's not a round charged in the breach of the weapon okay so to make that work what's got to happen and one more thing take off the safety there, there's four things. There's four things there. One, if somebody gets their hands on it, they got to do a complete evaluation why this doesn't work. Oh, the mag's not seated. Oh, there's nothing. There's, it's a fail to fire. Bracket. Oh, the safety's on. Okay, that all has to be done. Okay. Um, so somebody gets a hand up. But what does that do with the owner as well if they get up at 2.30 in the morning? He's got, if they got to think about that, then they're getting into, like you said, a cognitive state, okay, that they, they can now start to address properly the situation going on. Now, what I advise this person to do is to repeatedly and safely run through it. Okay, repeating safety run through it so they can, in a quick, in quick fashion, be able to get that weapon up and ready to use to defend themselves. Okay, so when we talk about safety in the home, we talk about safes, we talk about gun locks, we talk about um, different features that marry both the safety and the security of the weapon. There's multiple things there for you. It's just the bottom line is you're responsible for those, okay? And can we get lazy in things? Yes, we can get lazy. Are we pressed for time in life? I mean, there's a lot of times we're pressed for time. And even, even if you follow your habits, uh, you follow what you've always done, there's going to be times, there's gonna be times to where whatever security you got set up, no matter what it is, it may not, you may not have completed it. For the mere fact, you don't want to make that call back to your spouse or whoever who has grandchildren, your grandchildren are over, but you are someplace else and you make the call to your wife and say, hey, will you please check because I'm not sure. Okay? And it happens. You know, it happens. Just be cognizant of that, and I'm, and I'm sure you are. There's going to be times when the best plan that you have, it's with life and everything coming up, it may not happen, okay? So just double check and always be concerned, okay? Always be concerned and make sure, huh? okay. Yes? One of the things, I, I teach these, you know, the CCW classes, and we've had a lot of classes where both husband and wife take it, and I tried to get my wife to take it. She, I had to force her through it. She really yeah. didn't even get through it. But it's a, it's a really good thing if your wife has not done that to put them through those classes so that they at least understand how they work. Oh, um, you hit a great point there. I know right now, qualified adult, I don't have to go through CCW class. I got paid no money. I don't have to do I can just get a gun and do it. Believe me, they've, 
They've already brought it up prior to this. Anytime you can get some training, get some training, both in the legal aspect of it, right? What's your right to defend yourself, right? And also the weapons handling, okay? Uh, please, get, get training with that, okay? Get training with that. And if you have a spouse or if you have a, a friend who you're like, hey, they're getting a gun, mm, mm, all right? They, they need to have training. The better trained you are, the more confident you are with it um, uh, to understand both the legal side and the gun manipulation and gun safety side is only, it's only beneficial for you, okay? And your spouse or anyone else. Get the, get the training in it, okay? Uh, that's in the home. Okay, now you're carrying, now you're out and about, now you're in a Walmart. Uh, listen, if you have a, if you're, if you're a qualified adult and you can carry a firearm and you don't in Walmart, that is, you're going to get everything you deserve. Okay. You're going to get everything you deserve, right? Okay. You're qualified adult and you're carrying the weapon on you and other people are going to have weapons, right? I mean, it's probably going to be more prolific now than, than ever, right? And you get into some type of altercation, starts out verbal or whatever. Uh, you got a gun on you. They may have a gun on you, all right? You get in some physical altercation. Now, in close proximity, hand to hand, your gun may be exposed. They might know your gun. Gun retention now, okay? Could that possibly be a situation that could occur? Okay, so when we talk about, you know, and you bought your holster again, it's like, do you want in the band? What kind of holster do you want? There's dozens of them out there, dozens of different styles, but it's got to be something too, again, when you're looking at equipment, that it's something that's secure, but also you can get out, and if you need to use it, you can get it out quickly, okay, and be able to get it up and ready to use if necessary, okay? So we talk about these things, and I know it's 9 o'clock right now. So we won't get into, we won't go into the weeds too much with that, but understand that that's, that's a situation too, right? That could be a situation too, and you need to think about that a little bit, and you need to look at, okay, how can I best handle that situation as well? Okay, what's that? You have witnesses at Walmart? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then we start to look at them. Sure, let me have the time. Now, the credibility of the witness may come into uh, may come into account, but yes, you will have pe you will have people. So, listen, appreciate it. Appreciate you coming out. Appreciate your interest in this topic. And if you have any questions, anything, uh, oh, I believe we have gun locks right back there in the box. Make sure you get one. They're barrel locks. Go ahead and grab one. Thanks, thanks, guys and ladies.